Gresham College presents Regulating the Regulators by the Baroness Deitch of Cumnor, DBE. Now, this final lecture is rounding up with theory all the issues I've talked about in the previous five, where I've talked about institutions that I've regulated, whether it's the BBC or students or lawyers. So what are we doing when we regulate? On the day that I wrote this lecture, I had spent a great deal of time trying to give away an old but really very nice sofa to one of the local charities. They all told me that there is a great demand for them, but that they cannot accept mine because it was built before the coming into force of current fire regulations for furniture and it didn't have the requisite fire safety label under the Furniture and Furnishings Fire Safety Regulations 1988, which was extended in 1993 to second-hand furniture. So a perfectly nice sofa, I'm sure you will agree, uh, much better built than modern ones, and probably no more likely to burst into flame than the foam-filled ones went to waste and had to be carried at some expense to the local dump. Of course, fire safety is important, and one should not get rid of fire hazardous furniture to charities. But the downside, the waste of good material, is considerable. So now we come to consider regulation in general, after the specific examples I gave you in my previous five lectures, and whether that regulation does more harm than good or not. Regulation is not new. There were building controls in this country from as early as the 13th century. The Great Fire of London in, 19, in 1666 led to the London Building Act 1667, the first to provide for surveyors to enforce its regulations. In the 19th century, business became subject to regulation. There was a growth in insurance, company, and patent law and regulatory agencies. Modern regulation was given a boost by the privatization of modern services of the utmost significance, which, it was felt, could not be left to the mercies of private providers when it came to public safety. That was telecommunications in 1984, natural gas, 1986, airports, 1987, water, 1989, the electricity supply, 1990, and rail in 1993 onwards. Regulation for each of them replaced the nationalization element in these basic services. How does one define regulation? I would say it is the supervision of a private or professional activity in the interests of the public as a whole, their welfare, their rights and their future, where those elements would be at risk were there no regulation. After that uncontentious statement, there come the subdivisions and principles of regulatory activity, which are the subject of much academic writing and business interest, often adversarial in nature. For many centuries, professions such as medicine and law were trusted to self-regulate. And indeed, their professional pride was and is such that the strictest regulators are often one's own peers in a profession or business because there is self-interest in maintaining standards and entry. The long history of the famous livery guilds is actually one of regulation. The drapers, the merchant tailors, the skinners, and so on. Only when they relax their regulatory powers or have them taken away from them did they become the largely ceremonial and charity organisations that they are today. The four inns of court, which bear certain historic similarities, fortunately still have regulatory functions in respect to barristers, which keeps the inns alive and creative. More recently, self-regulation by the professions has been under attack because of failings within those professions. 
The Shipman inquiry into the deaths caused by the Dr. Shipman was a response to public loss of confidence in the medical profession over the issue. Then we had the Clementi review of legal regulation, largely as a result of poor complaints handling and bad practice by solicitors' firms in relation to minors' claims, where the lawyers took more money than the minors. Self-regulation of the press, as I need hardly tell you, is under examination after the phone hacking scandal of 2011. The modern requirement seems to be that there should be a representative branch of a profession, for example, the British Medical Association or the Law Society, and a separate regulatory branch of that same profession, for example, the General Medical Council and the Solicitor's Regulatory Authority. Ofcom is required to promote self-regulation, which is, after all, cheaper, whatever else may be said about it. On the one hand, the National Consumer Council, now called Consumer Focus, has campaigned for up to 75% consumer representation on regulatory boards. On the other hand, self-regulation is coming back into fashion and was recently espoused by the Office for Fair Trade for consumer issues in a report quite recently. Whilst transformation is now in sight for the Press Complaints Commission, which the Prime Minister branded as ineffectual during the phone hacking scandal, the Advertising Standards Authority seems to work well as a self-regulator. At the other end of the watchdog scale, there are now super regulators and regulators built on mergers of other smaller regulators, which have become national bodies in their own right and given rise to a body of law and theory about regulation. For example, the Financial Services Authority, an amalgamation of individual regulators over banks, insurance, financial advisors and mortgage businesses, of which more later. In favour of super regulators are the economies of scale, the fact that the boundaries between different types of financial activity have become blurred, they can achieve clear objectives across the field and result in only one body to deal with if they are merged. Likewise, Ofcom, reflecting the convergence of internet, broadcasting and telecommunications, Ofgem for gas and electricity, the Environment Agency and the Food Standards Authority. Super regulators won the praise of the Hampton Report, a very influential one in the field in 2005. Mr Hampton recommended more consolidation, such as the Equality and Human Rights Commission, which has now brought together all the equality and diversity bodies that used to exist. Ofsted is an amalgamation, the Audit Commission, the Care Quality Commission, all mergers. This was, of course, before the financial meltdown of a few years ago, with lessons to be learned from that, and before the weakness of the Care Quality Commission in preventing abuse in care homes was exposed in 2011. The risks of consolidation of smaller regulators are the cost of actually bringing them together in one office and the loss of specialisation and focus. There may be too much for one organisation to do. Ofcom's weakness was shown in relation to the quiz call and faked TV issues, if you remember them, and there is confusion over how jurisdiction over complaints is shared between Ofcom and the BBC. It was for those reasons, namely loss of specialisation and the disruption that would ensue, that up until 2011, the Human Fertilisation and Embryology Authority and the Human Tissue Authority avoided merger and had their separate natures confirmed in the Human Fertilisation and Embryology Act 2008. Ironically, given the problems with the Euro, the European Union would like to see a continent-wide super regulator for the financial sector, which would act as a whistleblower on banks and insurance if they're acting in a way that threatens continental financial security.
I'm keeping a straight face. One would have thought that they would have learned a lesson from the Financial Services Authority. So, not only are there conflicting tugs towards self-regulation on the one hand and super-regulation on the other, there are also many different types of regulation depending on what's being regulated and how. A basic division is between regulating a profession, setting disciplinary standards, procedures, education and training, as in the law, or on the other hand, commercial activities, such as airlines, taxis, where we all expect the driver to have done the knowledge and have a safe cab. Then there are the requirements of safety. For example, hospitals, food supplies, and gas installations, where the institutions and personnel must observe proper standards in order to safeguard the public from physical and economic harm. An example is the Gang Masters Licensing Act, that's the bottom photo, to regulate labor in shellfish collection after the tragedy of the deaths of 21 Chinese cockle pickers who drowned at Morecambe Bay in 2004. All of the constraints may be taken too far. The fear of complaints and litigation is widespread, leading to what has become known as the tick box culture in health and safety. Professional regulation may be subject to political pressures. For example, in the case of teachers or social workers. Institutions may become overburdened with social requirements relating to parental leave, diversity, and so on. Then there is the question of how far the government should get involved in regulation itself. Although one expects the government to be in the business of assurance, at the same time, it may be government action itself that is the root cause of failures in regulated activities. And the government might not want to call attention to its own failings in this regard. There could be a conflict of interest, and therefore it's better for the government to enable regulation at arm's length through independent quangos, which in turn ought to avoid being funded by the government so that they are truly independent. This is why many regulators are funded by fees and licenses raised from the regulated community rather than by tax, tax revenue. There are different categories of regulation. There's inspection with official mandate, licensing activities. There is quality regulation designed to assure the public by adjudication, inspection and information about the activity, for example, of universities by the Office of Independent Adjudication and the Higher Education Funding Council, or of IVF treatment by the Human Fertilization Embryology Authority and IVF clinics. There's economic regulation concerned with price setting, fair competition, value for money, and monitoring, for example, the BBC and HEFKE. And there is public audit to make sure public money is properly spent. Cutting across all of these are the various principles on which regulation might best work. Risk-based regulation focuses on avoiding the worst outcomes that can be predicted. Principled regulation sets high-level principles and makes activities illegal that might contravene them. The Financial Services Authority operates by way of laying down principles. There is rule-based regulation, such as the barristers are used to where the code lays down details of how they should behave at every stage. This tends to give good results, but is inflexible and voluminous. Then there's the latest fad, outcomes-focused regulation, OFR, although that seems now to have had its day too. It supposes regulation of a business or profession by looking at the outcomes, not detailed prescription. It is not clear, however, how to measure the outcome, which will have happened, possibly with bad results, by the time anyone looks at how things went wrong. It is not obvious what should be done by way of supervision or enforcement if a desired outcome, whatever that is, is not achieved. 
and in the copy of my lecture, which you can pick up, I've got scholarly references for all of that. The latest theories of regulation are called really responsive regulation and right touch regulation. The former, really responsive, requires that regulators regulate in response to the regulated firm's behavior, attitude, and culture. The institutional environment, interactions of regulatory controls, regulatory performance and change. What does this mean? I think this means that regulators should spend more time assessing their own performance and failures and the imperatives of the people and institutions that they oversee. And right touch regulation means always asking what risk the regulator is trying to regulate, being proportionate and targeted in regulating that risk or finding ways other than regulation to promote good practice, using regulation only when necessary and checking for unintended consequences. My own experience of the swings of the pendulum in what is expected of regulators came when I was chair of the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority. We were exhorted by the department to carry out light touch regulation and target inspections on clinics and laboratories, only the ones that were risky. But as soon as anything went wrong, especially if it was widely reported, for example, there was a mix up in embryos and couples were given the wrong embryos, government chastised us and urged more and more in-depth regulation of the clinics even though there was a limit, in my view, at which human error could not be avoided. Now, it is the revamped Financial Services Authority that's encouraged to move from light-touch regulation to intensive regulation. And if you don't like all that language, that is the language with which we regulators have to deal. Uh, in my office, I have banned, as best I can, the use of any of the following phrases in documents that come out of my office, the Bar Standards Board. Stakeholder, robust, transparent, going forward, delivery, KPIs, drill down, deep dive, embedded, fit for purpose, I'm sure you can all add to it. I'm gonna put out a glossary one of these days because you can put together documents jam-packed with those phrases, and they mean absolutely nothing if you're trying to find out what's wrong or what to do. So I try and ban all that language, and I don't think it has helped the status of modern regulation. All of that is difficult, but it's clear what bad regulation is. Bad regulation is regulation that does not achieve its ends, is overly expensive, intrusive, resented, and rigid and lacking in understanding of the objectives of the overseen. This can arise because of a failure to understand the public interest in carrying out regulation and by focusing solely on economic or political objectives, a subject to which I will return shortly. There are certainly plenty of known failures of regulation, not to mention the ones we do not know about. Examples are the Fukushima nuclear disaster, the deep water accident in the Mexico Gulf, and the, the subprime lending meltdown and its consequences. Baby P, remember Baby P? The fate of Baby P might have been better if the uh, local authorities were prepared to use risk-based regulation, because although it's not politically correct to say so, you better not report me, the risk areas are where the mother of the baby is living with a man who is not her husband. That is when the baby is more likely to get battered, but you're not allowed to say that. Railway accidents, that's another example that's gone wrong, and a water system pollution and floods. Regulation is supposed to protect ordinary people and prevent catastrophes at the very least. Part of the trouble may be the confusion of the different types of regulation, business, professional, etc., which I have roughly outlined. Where regulation was introduced to control monopolies and set standards, arguably its success should have led to its own winding up 
as no longer necessary. So sometimes regulation should fade away. In other situations, failure leads to more regulation, which in turn is regarded as burdensome and may fail. Failure on the part of the Financial Services Authority presumably contributed to the financial crisis and economic recession. Indeed, the FSA conceded that Northern Rock was inadequately regulated and that it had failed to focus on the large systemic risks in the banking system in the recent report. Nevertheless, Mr. Sants, its chief executive, has gone on to head the new Prudential Regulation Authority, part of the carve-up and demise of the FSA. The other part of the FSA will be the Financial Conduct Authority, responsible for supervising the way financial firms treat their customers, while the Prudential Regulation Authority will be responsible for supervising banks, building societies, credit unions and insurance firms. It is to have a more intensive brief in preventing damage to the financial system. The cost of this reconfiguration has been estimated at 90 to 175 million by the Treasury in 2011. The skeptical observer might think that the more attention paid by regulators to models of regulatory practice, the less successful at foreseeing disasters. Internal scrutiny and the language, the forbidden language I've just quoted, seems to blind regulators to external threats. The House of Commons Regulatory Reform Committee report called Themes and Trends in Regulatory Reform 2009 called for a move away from concentration on a particular model of regulation and more focus instead on looking at the whole system rather than individual problem areas, challenging prevailing wisdoms and political pressures, not to rely too much on ideology and procedures, and to be intrusive or light touch as required, in other words, flexible. The cost of all of this regulation is considerable. The British Chamber of Commerce calculated that the net cost of new regulation since 1999 amounted to £90 billion. And the Better Regulation Task Force estimated the cost at 12% of GDP. The Institute of Directors claims that directors spend 13 hours a month on regulation compliance and would have to work from the 1st of January to the 4th of February to complete annual administration while the workforce spends 73 hours a month on it. And that the burden of regulation is equivalent to the UK losing the entire output of the East Midlands. Among the most expensive regulations to apply are the Working Time Regulations 1999, the Data Protection Act, now there's a bad act if ever I saw one, I've spoken about that before, and the Vehicle Excise Duty Reduced Pollution Regulations. 68% of the regulation is attributed to European law. As fast as you cut down one bit, some more comes springing up from Europe. Open Europe, uh, uh, an institution, calculated the cost of European regulation requirements as £124 billion since 1998. And there were 11,000 pages of new European legislation in 2007. What are these regulatory bodies that we are talking about? Here is a list of just some of the non-professional ones. Animal Health Care Quality Commission, some of them, I don't even know what the, what the uh, letters stand for. Charity Commission, Civil Aviation, Companies House, Competition Commission, Drinking Water Inspectorate, Driving Standards Agency, Driving Vehicle Licensing Authority, Employment Agency Standards Inspectorate, Environment Agency, European Human, uh, uh, Equality and Human Rights Commission, Financial Reporting Council, FSA, Food and Environment Research Agency, Food Standards Agency, 
Football Licensing Authority, Forestry Commission, Gambling Commission, Gang Masters Licensing Authority, Human Fertilization Embryology Authority, Health and Safety Executive, Human Tissue Authority, Information Commissioner's Office, Insolvency Service, Marine and Fisheries Agency, Maritime and Coast Guard Agency, um, Medical Health, National Lottery, National Measurement, Natural England, Ofcom, Office of Fair Trade, Office of Rail Regulation, Office of the Immigration Services Commissioner, Ofgem, Ofqual, Ofsted, Ofwat, Pensions Regulator, Postcom, Renewable Fuels, Rural Payments, Standards for England, Security Industry Authority, Vehicle Certification, Veterinary Medicines Directorate, Vehicle and Operator Services Agency. I'm just scraping the surface. Imagine how many people they employ. And they've given birth to a new category of person known as a quango queen. I have to plead guilty because I've uh, operated quite a few quangos in my time. There are women, sometimes men, but quite a lot of women, who move seamlessly from one quango to another without necessarily knowing much about the, the thing that they regulate. And if you can keep talking at the interview about sustainable, ongoing, deep dive uh, <laughs> with KPIs, transparent, robust, and of course, subscribing to the Nolan principles, you're in and you get a job. And you can put up, you can put together quite a portfolio of these. They don't pay very well, they just pay a little bit. But if you accumulate a few, it, it adds up. The public bodies bill, the coalition government's brave attempt to drastically prune the number was introduced in the House of Lords in 2011 with a list of approximately 230 quangos listed as liable to be merged, abolished, or reformed. By the time the bill left the Lords for the Commons, the list was down to 92. There was enormous resistance to almost every proposed removal either from vested interests or genuine public anxiety, for example, over the forestry commission. The forest of Quangos remains as thick as ever. And I plead guilty because I fought and continue to fight to keep the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority, my own little Quango. All the others may be rubbish, but that one is certainly <laughs> very, very important. So many bodies, so much to do on what principles? Having researched this, I had to draw a line after a while, for the principles of regulation are manifold, and every few years more are added. Some go out of fashion and others enter. Regulation theory is a curious academic world where the results and the public good seem to count for less than the perfection and symmetry of the principles that regulators should be applying in their task. Widely accepted, or at least most often quoted, are the Hampton Report-inspired better regulation principles. Regulation, he said, should be, guess what, transparent, accountable, proportionate, consistent, and targeted. In fact, the Hampton principles were more detailed than that, and the five guiding principles actually came from the government assessment. One can quickly see that the questions lurking behind these principles may be hard to answer. Accountable to whom? Proportionate by what standards? Targeted at what? Transparent, by the way, does not carry the dictionary definition of clear or easily seen through, artless, frank, free from affectation or disguise. Today, Transparent means giving an explanation or putting the information guiding the regulators up on their website. Clear talk and simple language are elements largely missing from the world of regulation, whose documents are replete with the self-congratulatory phrases of business school. I can't resist it. Robust stakeholders. Partnership. That's a very popular partnership. KPIs going forward, drilling down delivery and so on. Sanctions in regulation are governed by the Macrory report called Regulatory Justice, Making Sanctions Effective 2006, the recommendations of which were enacted in the Regulators Enforcement and Sanctions Act 2008. This increased the range of sanctions for regulators 
with guidance of the following principles. That the purpose of regulatory sanction is not to punish as such, but to get the business affected back into compliance and make sure that no financial profit is made from non-compliance. Also that financial penalties should not be received by the regulators so that they can't be accused of profiteering from enforcement. The Audit Commission report called The Future of Regulation in the Public Sector 2006 called for first order principles that regulation should take place within a stable framework determined by government, that government must be clear about the role it wants to play, that the scope and scale is a matter for government. Changes to the framework should be minimised and regulators must be operationally independent. Some of these principles might trouble those who believe that government should stay as far away from regulation as possible because of the potential conflicts of interest I mentioned earlier, where the government itself is at fault. Indeed, the Audit Commission's own emphasis in this document on independence sits uneasily with its implied expectation of heavy intervention by government. The influential Hampton principles in detail are that regulators should use comprehensive risk assessment to concentrate resources on the areas that need them most. Regulators should be accountable for the efficiency and effectiveness of their activities while remaining independent in the decisions they take. No inspection should take place without a reason. Businesses should not have to give unnecessary information or give it twice. Those who break the regulations should be identified quickly and face proportionate sanctions. Regulators should provide authoritative, accessible advice easily and cheaply. Regulators should be of the right size and scope and no new one should be created where an existing one can do the work. Regulators should recognize that a key element of their activity will be to allow or even encourage economic progress and only intervene where there is a clear case for protection. One can see that these principles have been broken many times and predate the financial crisis of recent years. Also that they are very business oriented with no hint in them of how they might apply to the regulation of the professions or say higher education. In fact, when it came to regulating the legal professions, the government adopted an entirely different approach and laid down in the Legal Services Act 2007 a different set of principles and objectives listed in section one. And I won't read them out because there they are on the uh, board, at least a, a synthesis of them. There are contradictions and dilemmas in all of these, especially the professional principles that require, for example, barristers to comply with their duty to the court to act with independence in the interests of justice, which may go against all the other regulatory principles. There are contradictions and dilemmas, and there is no order of precedence in those principles. The Legal Services Board, the regulator, is itself charged under the Act with acting according to the Hampton Principles and also any other principle appearing to it to represent the best regulatory practice. This certainly leaves the field wide open for discretionary decisions about how to achieve aims. The Legal Services Board, which is the one that regulates me, has tended to put the consumer first in order of objectives. It has been said in relation to multiple objectives that the financial crisis provided compelling evidence that proponents of the integrated model underestimated the challenges involved in the management of multiple regulatory objectives and in resolving conflicts between them. And that comes from an academic study of the breakup of the Financial Services Authority. On the other hand, naturally, too many regulators pursuing each their own separate objectives in relation to one activity will be just as problematic. The biggest city solicitors firms have de facto set up a regulatory system for themselves within the overall solicitors regulatory authority regime. 
Every few years, there is another set of principles advanced as the best in the regulatory field. Looming over all of them, however, now is the economic recession and an announced change of policy by the coalition government, which has attempted to cut every quango that it can in the Public Bodies Act 2012. Targets and performance monitoring, especially in health service regulation, are now perceived to stifle innovation and hold back the better performers. There are renewed calls for more self-regulation and market mechanisms to ensure high-quality services. The history of government initiatives to curb and streamline regulation and regulators is impressively long but wayward. The government has tried repeatedly to reduce the burden but there are always big issues demanding special protection in their view, such as employment, diversity and climate change, all sacrosanct, which prevent a wholesale clear out, not to mention the demands of the European Union. Ruth Lee, in her 2011 study called Perspectives for the Arbuthnot Banking Group, listed the attempts to cut them, which are up there on your slide. Right? Keeps trying to cut them off and they keep growing again. So I won't list them all, but in alphabetical order, one after another report has said that the regulations should be cut and tailored and got rid of. But it's all so inconsistent. For example, one better regulation unit replaces another. They get renamed. They all give out different messages. Um, and then their recommendations get contradicted. For example, the Human Tissue Authority was pronounced as a good example of Hampton compliance. So it's ironic that it is now slated for merger or abolition under the Public Bodies Act. Most recently, the Chancellor launched the Better Regulation Action Plan in 2005, and the McCrory Report was published. In 2006, the Better Regulation Commission replaced the Better Regulation Task Force. I bet no one knows the difference. In 2007, the Department of Business, Enterprise and Regulatory Reform took over from the DTI and the Better Regulation Executive. And in turn, that department became the Department of Business, Innovation and Skills in 2009. In 2008, the Better Regulation Commission was replaced by the Risk and Regulatory Advisory Council, and the local Better Regulation Office was set up only to close in 2010, and so on and so forth. The McCrory Report um, did result in uh, a number of uh, inspections, 2 million. 0.8 inspections a year, 56 national regulators, 468 local authorities, uh, issued 400,000 warning letters and so on. Uh, so they did have some effect. A recent depressing report is the better regulation one called Lightening the Load, the regulatory impact on the UK's smallest businesses published in 2010 by the Department of Business, Innovation and Skills. They studied 500 small businesses who reported that they were working one or two days a week on regulation issues as distinct from their core business and felt frustration, experienced complexity and misunderstanding and suffered with the tax system. The report concluded that the burden was excessive. The principles-based regulations can be difficult to interpret for small businesses that they perceived no simplification and were at a disadvantage compared with bigger businesses in handling regulation. Note the focus on business, not services. Complexity and misunderstanding are terms that are appropriate to apply in dealing with this long list of initiatives to reduce or change regulation, not to mention the regulations themselves and the principles on which they are based and enforced. The latest attempt to cut the Gordian knot is by Lord Young of Grafham. He was the gentleman of whom Baroness Thatcher said, other people bring me problems, David Young brings me solutions. He published a report in 2010 called Common Sense, Common Safety, 
an outspoken attempt to bring reason to what is going on. His report focused on health and safety and the so-called compensation culture, for he believes that litigation is at the heart of the problems besetting health and safety. In 2009, there were 800,000 compensation claims made in the UK. Businesses, he said, feared being sued for minor accidents and it was easier to settle than fight. Claims companies who advertised for victims and the no win, no fee arrangements fueled the litigation torrent. All of you must have heard on the radio, especially classic FM, you know, have you tripped over recently? Uh, have you got a claim? We'll sort it for you. The philosophy of if there's a blame, there's a claim has generated fear, he said, which extends to the way that schools and fates, voluntary work, sports and cultural activities have to defend and protect themselves against liability to an excessive level. Very recently, I wrote to my old school, as I do every year, volunteering to take 12 sixth formers, or whatever they're called these days, round the House of Lords to listen to a debate and have tea. And these six formers are 17 and tower above me, no doubt. And the school wrote back and said, I had to have a criminal records check. You can imagine my response. He pointed out, I refused. So they're sending a teacher with the children to safeguard them from me. <laughs> he pointed out, uh, David Young pointed out that uh, employment, the, that the employment that these health and safety regulations have given to claims management companies, insurance companies, and safety consultants. He recommended banning referral fees, whereby, for example, an estate agent who refers a buyer to one solicitor or a claims management committee company tied to a solicitor are able to get a kickback from the lawyer for each case referred. He recommended simplifying and easing the process applying to schools that take children on trips and relieving police and fire officers of liability under health and safety if they put their lives at risk to rescue someone inter alia. While Lord Young's recommendations have not so far been implemented, his straightforward approach to the risks and burdens of regulation have had the effect of highlighting what's missing in all the bodies, principles, objectives, reports, and regulatory bodies that I have described so far. What's missing? It is the public interest or the broader picture. It is the need to get away from the obsession with internal governance and tick boxing within the regulatory bodies themselves in order that they lift their eyes and look around them and look to the future. This is often called the public interest, but then one asks, where should the responsibility lie for defining the public interest? It is of note that government statutes and reports have usually listed many principles and objectives in no particular order and have not given regulators, let alone individual regulators, a single goal to pursue. The best attempt at this I've come across, albeit focusing on legal regulation, is a publication by Stephen Mason at the Legal Services Institute 2011. Rejecting quite rightly the formula that market forces and competition are everything, he defines the public interest in his discussion of law as, I quote, objectives and actions for, uh, sorry, uh, for the collective benefit and good of current and future citizens in achieving and maintaining those fundamentals of society that are regarded by them as essential to their common security and well-being and to their legitimate participation in society. The public interest has two principal dimensions, he goes on to say. The fabric of society, including defence and security, public order, the rule of law and the administration of justice, protection of the environment, effective government and a sound economy. Then participation in all of that is ensured by health, education and welfare, access to justice, human rights and equality, and reliable personal, public and commercial relationships. The value of having a definition and sense of the good that services and professions are meant to uphold 
is that one can argue against a hijacking of the phrase public interest by narrower interest groups. In the case of law, it could be hijacked by politicians, consumers, clients, the professionals, media, the courts, judges, unions, defendants. And one can also dismiss the notion that economic regulation is the major or only form of regulation. Economic style regulation, which has already harmed the legal profession by pressure for new working practices and undermining professional pride and standards, has no eye for future generations' inheritance. The belief that market economy is a good thing, that profit and competition should be maximized because they will benefit consumers, is not only inappropriate as a dominating factor in legal regulation, but has been shown to contain the seeds of its own downfall when the markets go wrong. Consumer protection and consumer choice were shown to be uneasy bedfellows in our recent financial crisis. And equally difficult is the balancing of the building of consumer trust at the same time as encouraging consumer personal responsibility. Legal regulation in recent years has tended to try to limit behavior that is likely to interfere with competition and to encourage symmetry of information. But the marketization of everything is not good. Witness the riots of 2011 and the financial crisis. And you should read Michael Sandel, the BBC Reef lecturer of a few years ago, uh, I think about three years ago, his, his uh, series was called A New Citizenship. Putting the consumer first and private economic interests are not the right answer when it overrides the demands of citizenship or the democratic view. Economic interests, competition and marketization are not the answer when it comes to national health or education, for example. Moral values must enter in, says Mason. And since the riots of 2011 and the MPs' expenses scandal, it has become acceptable once again to speak of morals in public life. Competition and consumerism have downsides that may damage the present and future public interest. And both the Clementi Report and the Legal Services Act 2007 failed to see this. Cheaper, more widespread and outsourced legal services and advice may be good for some, but may harm others and the fabric of the democratic society. One should not conflate the consumer and the public interest. Legal regulation should not be concerned with the cheapness of the here and now, but ensuring all the time that law is reliable and stable, administered by those trained to the highest standards, and that it is preserving resources for the future. There is an international dimension to all of this as well, as Mason points out. English law is copied and used internationally, and any perceived state intervention with the independence and quality of our lawyers will cause Britain to lose business and punch below her weight internationally. Confidence in the English legal system is critical to our social stability global competitiveness and economic success. At the heart of this is the centuries-old way in which existing lawyers have ensured that the qualifications and performance of the next generation is up to standard. In conclusion, therefore, your favorite words, to improve the regulatory scene, I would recommend that a definition of the public interest with those elements dominate the thinking of regulators. I would also recommend that regulators get the right balance between independence and expertise on boards. Too many boards are dominated by appointments of persons from outside the profession or service who might bring no more than generalities, robust, transparent, etc., to bear on the issues. There should be post-implementation review of legislation and regulation. Too often, a regulatory statute is passed by Parliament and never revisited to see if it's working and working in the public interest. 2012 marks five years since the passage, for example, of the Legal Services Act, and that would be ripe for scrutiny. 
Departments have not routinely evaluated the impact on business of regulation once it's come into effect, let alone on services and the professions. The National Audit Office is critical of government departments and of the better regulatory scrutiny bodies themselves for failing to appreciate the total scale of regulatory burden. I give the last word to my old friend, Professor Richard Epstein of New York University, one of the most influential US legal thinkers and an advocate of minimal legal regulation. I quote, complex rules necessarily confer a large measure of discretion upon those who enforce and interpret the law, thereby increasing the level of uncertainty and error when the rule is honestly applied, and the level of abuse when it is dishonestly or incompetently applied. In sum, too much discretionary lawmaking power is delegated to unelected administrators who have their own agenda and who are left free to apply to the professions, to business and services, whatever regulatory principle they feel expedient, such as consumerism, without being there to suffer the consequences. There isn't time, but I was going to read you a wonderful spoof on regulation. You know when you get on board a plane and the first couple of minutes, the uh, stewardess stands up and says, you know, these are the safety regulations. And I've got this wonderful spoof where she, she reads out, um, you know, take your, your life belt from under your seat, you know, blow, puff it up and zip it round. And then the, the commentary says, there is no known case in the world of any good being done in any aircraft by the wearing of this jacket. You're being told this in order to make you feel a bit better. Um, and then there's another thing about, you know, you're told to switch your phone off. Uh, but in fact, shortly, planes are going to allow people to use their phones and charge you for the privilege of doing so. So, so much for phones. We're telling you that phones are not safe says the stewardess, and the subtext is, but they will be once uh, the airlines get some money off you to pay for them. And uh, you know the slide that goes out of a plane, you're told to take off your high heels and slide down the slide. Well, again, there is no example on earth of that ever having saved anybody, like just something else to make you feel better, and so on and so forth. Anyway, I conclude there. Time for five minutes or so of questions. And thank you very much. It's been a pleasure and a privilege to be associated with Gresham, which has performed a wonderful public job in the city for hundreds of years. Long may it flourish, and I know that you will enjoy very much the exciting international lectures that will be given by my successor, Sir Geoffrey Nice QC, next year. Thank you all very much. Just setting aside for one moment this duality or this opposition between the interests of consumers and the legal profession, perhaps, um, do you recognize the idea, perhaps, of a regulator as a buffer, an ab absorber of complaints such that um, the development of the law proper may actually be inhibited and it, in effect, it's just a device so that Parliament doesn't have to trouble itself with a given area um, on behalf of its yes. electorate. Okay. <laughs> I think that's a very perceptive point. In law, there is an office, which I didn't mention, because I think it's a very good one, the Office of Legal Complaints, which has been up and running for a couple of years and is doing a very good job and has taken most of the complaints uh, away from the solicitor's profession and the bar and deals with them there. And I think that's quite right. The bar, I mean, I would say this, wouldn't I, did not have very many complaints, but the solicitors had a lot. And they are now being handled objectively outside the system. Uh, I used to chair the Human Fertilization Embryology Authority, and I had no doubt at the time that we were actually a sort of lightning rod for the government, because when anything went wrong in the stem cell embryo IVF field, the department could say, oh, nothing to do with us, it's the Human Fertilization Embryology Authority. But when things went well, and Britain was one of the first to clone Dolly the sheep and, and go ahead the stem cells, then of course the government took the, the credit for it. And we were a sort of lightning rod. Yes, I think, I think that's true. And of course a, a handler of complaints. Yes. On the subject of the professional regulators, and the SRA seems as good a place to um, start as any, there's plainly a balance to be struck between protecting the consumer of uh, legal services and uh, 
the regulator discharging its obligations to the regulated person with uh, the proper, dare I say, transparency, openness, proportionality, etc. cetera. Um, where a regulator fails a consumer, it seems to me there's quite a lot of redress that the consumer could look to, particularly with the Office of Legal Complaints and uh, the Legal Ombudsman, dare I say, probably even the uh, Legal Services Board. What of the regulated person who is let down by a regulator who fails to uh, do its job properly? Whether substantively, or I'm thinking more, um, dare I say, with the SRA procedurally, where uh, so much time passes before any decisions are made, um, and where it's sometimes difficult if one is subject to <clears throat> Uh, investigation of whatever level to know exactly what's going on. What can that person do? There are two points in what you say. One is, one has to distinguish broadly between two branches of the legal profession. I have no doubt that solicitors are in the main consumer facing. They're the first point of call. And it's right that the interest of the consumer should be very much uh, to the forefront there. When it comes to the barrister, very often, broadly, you're one stage further along the line. And the barrister you could describe as court-faced, litigation-faced, rather than consumer-faced. For example, the barrister, even though the client begs the barrister to do this, that, or the other in court, if it's not something that the barrister should do, then he just shouldn't do it. I mean, the client might say to the barrister, hide this document. Don't tell them I'm really guilty, or whatever it might be. The barrister mustn't do that. He owes a higher, or she owes a higher duty to the court. Um, and as for the interest of those complained against, yes, that is a very real issue. Most complaints are now handled by the legal ombudsman, the Office of Legal Complaints. Where uh, a solicitor or barrister is unhappy with the way a complaint against him or her is being handled by the BSB or the SRA, uh, it has to go all the way to the end. There's a whole layer upon layer system of appeals going all the way to visitors. And then at the end, you could even seek judicial review. I mean, I know it's lengthy, but there is redress all the way along the line. Um, the, one, one of the issues, I think, is where you've got the conflict of um, regulations. And I'm a little surprised by the fact that the whistleblowing regulations that have been around for the last 20 years just haven't worked because once the whistle is blown, the establishment, whether it's the European Union or whatever, gets together and says, oh, you haven't complied with the blah, blah, blah of the uh, employees' regulations in relation to this, that, and the next thing. So you, you've got these regulators that are almost uh, hell-bent on making sure that the system of, if you like, whistleblowing just doesn't work. How do we get around that? I'm not an expert on whistleblowing. I agree with you. I think there are problems about whistleblowing. Because on the one hand, whistleblowers ought to have protection. On the other hand, some professions might try and make a whistleblower sign a confidentiality agreement. And I haven't followed it that closely, but I know that the cause of certain whistleblowers has been taken up by outspoken MPs who have used their privilege in the House of Commons to talk about uh, practices condemned by whistleblowers, which um, um, lawyers might have tried to stop being revealed. I think that area is, in, I agree with you, I think that area is, is full of conflicts and needs sorting out. I, I agree. I'm, unfortunately, I'm not a great expert on that particular area, but I think you're right. Uh, gentleman at the front here. Uh, you listed uh, very helpfully the, the sort of history of the different uh, uh, trends or fads in, 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 in regulation, and, but you touched on the possibility of there being journalism-driven regulation or tabloid-driven, you know, so when a scandal happens, you yes. know, resources flood to that form of regulator. Yes. Um, do you feel that there's, the, 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 I mean, how much of a role does that play? Is there a regulator where it would be conceivable for there to be a massive scandal without any public interest in it? And, and how would that regulator you know, go about enforcing in an environment where people weren't 
where there was no real scandal publicly about. But yes, uh, it's very hard for regulators to have a scandal these days without the newspapers discovering it, because with freedom of information and so on, things can be dug up. And for all one says about the British press, and it's very much under criticism at the moment, it is still a free press, and it still has a very good track record of investigative journalism. And journalists have done many a thing, which involves quite often breaking the law in the public interest, they would say, and digging out things like the MP's expenses, the details of which were obtained, I believe, illegally. But certainly press interest had a big influence on the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority when I was there, and of course uh, on the BBC and on Parliament. And press interest and press pressure may lead either to new regulation being established or to the condemning of existing regulation as no good. For example, in healthcare, every time the newspapers uncover another case of an old age home where old folk are being treated very badly, then the Care Quality Commission comes in for disapproval and so on. So the media are actually very important in this and their investigative journalism is extremely important. I think the final question there at the back, and then I, th I think I have to stop. Uh, thank you very much for a very interesting uh, lecture. Uh, I have a quick question because I work in finance and obviously uh, the industry is very regulated, especially uh, and definitely it's uh, becoming more and more, after, more and more regulated after the crisis. And I experienced the cost of this regulation uh, directly given that I have to pay for lawyers, for FSA compliance people, uh, consultants, etc. But, um, but I, I just wonder that, for ex just to be fair to pointless regulations, for example, is that every, even the most pointless uh, piece of regulation, it will involve, say, for example, businesses paying some fees to, say, lawyers and consultants, etc. So, and you talked obviously about the high cost of regulation. But sometimes I wonder that maybe for the society as a whole, isn't it the case that the society as a whole will actually not incur a cost? Because what I'm paying, for example, to a consultant or, or lawyer, it's an income for him. So maybe the net cost of regulation is just zero. There is no actual cost. Thank you. Well, this is a cynical but probably true point of view. Yes, a lot of people are making income and circulating money around in the interest of regulation. I think that's true. I mean, the lawyers have to pay whatever it is annually to the Solicitor's Regulatory Authority or the Bar Standards Board, which they probably recoup from their clients. So it, it, it all goes round. That's true. That is perfectly true. And it's a new profession in itself. OK, I think we have to stop. Thank you all very much. For all information, please visit www.gresham.ac.uk.